Thank you for joining us here at Victory Church. My name is Becky, and I'm the worship director here, and we pray that this sermon blesses your life today. Don't forget to click and subscribe so you never miss a message. Okay, uh, I'm already still kind of thinking through, all right? There's a lot to process today, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Jezebel. Actually, we're going to talk a lot about Jezebel. We're going to talk a little bit about wickedness, and we're going to talk about patience, Um, and time. Uh, I remember um, when I first started and my very first sermon uh, that I gave here or there or in Chula Vista, let's just say that, in Chula Vista, and it was July 18th, um, 2004. Um, I just remember that date for some reason. And in that, I was like, okay, what are we going to do? It was your first sermon, your first impression and some of you may remember it, some of you don't, uh, because I don't remember a lot of my sermons, so I get it. Um, but I remember that first one, and I asked a question. I said, is anybody here nervous? Because I was nervous. And one brave soul said, yes. And then I'm like, all right. I'm like, great, so we're not alone. And in the middle of that sermon, uh, towards the end of it, it was the Good Samaritan. And if you're familiar with the story, we're not going to go over it. Um, but if you're familiar with the story, that at the end, the Good Samaritan, you have, you have two priestly type figures in that who did nothing because uh, they didn't want to get dirty. They didn't want to get their stuff dirty. And then the Good Samaritan uh, did what needed to be done to help someone. And in that sermon, I remember... Uh, at the end of it, actually taking all this stuff off. So that we were seeing today, I just took it off and just put it to the side. Nothing wrong with it, but and it was kind of my statement and to all of to the church that I will be who I need to. I don't know what I was trying to say, but that we're not that we're not afraid to get dirty. And I really hope that in the period of time that we've been serving together, that. Uh, it's also a statement for me that what you see is what you get. Um, I'm very private to a degree. I'm introverted. Uh, I've also found out that whoever been sat in meetings with me, you know a lot of times I say nothing. Uh, because to me, I feel like if it's been said, why do I need to say it? And then at the end of the meeting, everybody looks at me down at the end like, are you going to say anything? And I'm like, yeah, what they said. Uh, I don't need to, why do I need to say anything? Um, but what you see is what you get. And, uh, and a lot of what you're going to see today, I think, is going to be along those lines. It's how I preach and how I kind of handle my business, negatively, positively, right? It always shakes out like that. But you think about Jezebel and think about how this story kind of connects with that was that here you've got a person who is very hungry for things who are not from God, uh, who are hungry for possessions, hungry for power, hungry for all these things, and then play a part, and she's devious. I think that's what we get from that story. It isn't just like, you know, Pharaoh is in your face because he's Pharaoh, and he could be, and she's just kind of in the background stirring stuff up. And... It's not by the way the fact that some of you are thinking like Jezebel, ooh, woman, right? And no, this is man, woman. We all know people like this. If you go around uh, the world today and you walk up to anybody and you say, um, hey, man, you're, you're a Jezebel. And you can say it as nice as you want, as nice as you can, that person is going to be offended, right? Because then you may not even know the story. But that name is so synonymous with, like, you're a Jezebel. Negative. You're a Jezebel. Mm, I think I just got mm, insulted, right, kind of thing. It's never positive. And this is what this woman has done to this name. It's not a particularly ugly name. You know, it's very similar to something like Jessica. Jezebel, Jessica, it's about the same. I will lodge a lot of nice Jessicas, but I have not met any Jezebels. She's ruined it. And so we got to wonder now, well, then who actually was she? We know she was from the Bible. So who actually was this character? Who was this person who actually existed, who has turned this name into an insult? And we kind of get an idea about what she's all about. One of the things we find out about her is that she is the the daughter of Ethbaal, king of 
Sidon. So you got a political marriage happening here between her and King Ahab, King Ahab of Israel. It says Samaria in our text today. Uh, that was the re- reference to like the capital of Israel as Samaria. Now the name itself, daughter of Eth Baal, which is a reference to Baal, or sometimes you pronounce it Baal, who is a false idol, a false god, a prominent one in the Old Testament a prominent one of the idols who, again, as we see in this story, does nothing. A false idol that does nothing. Nothing to be scared of, but people still worship it. So she's the daughter of somebody who worships Baal. It's a big part of her life. Uh, We know that she's the queen of Israel as King Ahab's wife, and then we know her as a worshiper of Baal. So then it wasn't that. She just also brought that with her, brought that into the family. And one of the... the, um, warnings that God gave to the people as they moved into the promised land and said, hey, be careful about who you marry and intermarry with because you're going to not, it's not a culture thing, it's a God thing, and you're going to bring in idols from other places. You want to make sure that your household stays true in true worship to the Lord. And like a lot of times, you know, people don't pay attention and they don't listen. So King Ahab has already been down this road. He's like, he wasn't like a pure guy. He was already not great. Uh, in fact, we learn about him. It says, in the, 20, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. So Ahab reigned for 22 years. And it says, Ahab, did son, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were born before him. Uh, And as it had been a light thing, I love this, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, like your forefathers, like I'm going to keep going in this. It was a light thing for him. This is just what you do, right? We just do this. We are walking in sin and who cares? It's a light thing. It says, in that spirit, then, he took wife, his wife, Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So this is all the context about Jezebel and Ahab. And by the way, it's not just how many Jezebels do you know. How many Ahabs do you know? If they're not in the book Moby Dick, outside of that, how many Ahabs do you really know? Right? Never a positive thing either. And so, as a couple, they're awful. They're absolutely awful people. And she kind of gets the, the short end of the stick on this because of her influence, her subversive kind of influence that she had. And so, what did she do? Uh, evil things that she did. Um, she killed the prophets of the Lord. Massacred, wiped out, murdered the prophets of the Lord. And we're not just talking the prophets like one, two, three, or four, hundreds of people who are faithful to God, murdered, dead. Uh, There's a prophet by the name of Obadiah who um, went and hid 100 prophets into the caves, figured out what was happening, hid them in the caves uh, just to save them. But she killed prophets of God, people of the Lord. Uh, She threatened Elijah, And we talked about that story a few weeks ago as VBS was kind of wrapping up. Um, She threatened the prophet Elijah. And Elijah, his whole point in his ministry was really to show God's power over the power of Baal to convince people, look, Baal does nothing. The Lord Almighty, the name of God, can do anything and everything that he wants. He's powerful and Baal's nothing. And it broke his heart that Jezebel was still, I'm going to kill that guy. Even after seeing it all, her whole world getting blown away, she still wanted to kill him. And so he was worried about that, stressed out about that. And then we have the story today where she ordered the murder of Naboth. And it's this amazing story. Like, And somebody said this morning, uh, but he said this morning, you saw the bolt. You're like, well, it's a long one today. And, uh, and so... We read through it because you had to see what the story is of what the full story of, and this is just one of the stories of what this person did. You know, you already think through it. It's like she sees her husband, Ahab, sulking. 
And then she walks in and says, you know, you know uh, what kind of king are you? What kind of king are you? You're not going to go get this stuff. So you can already get that relationship, right? You, know, you kind of already get that knocking back and forth between the two of them. And then she does that, and she uh, does that, and then on her hands then sets off this guy up to be killed and murdered. Just set up two guys, falsely accuse him, kill him, and then the field's ours. And this is a person who worships Baal but doesn't recognize really any authority. Because Baal does nothing. He does nothing. So there's nobody to answer to. She can do whatever she wants. And so who really cares? And then this is her um, legacy as a person. This is her legacy. It's summed up in 1 Kings 21, in which we read just a little bit earlier. Uh, Her legacy is, is of great wickedness. She persuaded her husband and others to oppose Yahweh and commit evil deeds, but they were already leaning that way, so it wasn't like she's the source. But her legacy is preserved in 1 Kings 21, 25. says, truly, there is no one like Ahab who sold himself, sold himself prostitute, sold himself by doing evil in the eyes of Yahweh, whose wife Jezebel urged him on. Like, let's, let's do all this stuff. And then we have a question now really about what's her character. And this is something to really pay attention to is what we learn from this story. It's not just about an evil woman, but it can also talk to us about what can lie inside of here. Um, I have friends who are in like the Pentecostal background and they have, you know, driving, actively driving out spirits and demons and things. And they have a spirit they name the spirit of Jezebel. I said, what's the character? What's the description of it? And first of all, one was, first comment was, man or woman. It's not just woman, not just man, man or woman. And it says this, the the character of the spirit of Jezebel is all about manipulation and control. Must be in control of all areas and people in an environment. Somebody who distorts the truth, always makes others seem in the wrong, uses guilt as a tactic, normally mocks and scoffs at authority, will normally start to laugh as soon as confronted, ha, <laughs> uh, gravitate towards those with power and influence and will try to control them. Have you ever met anybody like that before? Yeah, you have. Okay, we've all met people like this. We've all run into people like this. Um, Think about time, right? Think about time in 20 years, 25 years. I've run into people like this. In fact, I remember um, training to become a pastor, still at the school, still at the seminary, and we would do these um, academic, all of our academic courses, and then uh, once a quarter we'd have like a seminar on things. And we should have had more seminars, honestly, and less classes, I think, because it was about people. They don't teach you how about people. But then this one was about people where somebody came up and she was the uh, wife of the president of the seminary. And she just basically told us, in terms of working in your churches, she said, beware of the person who greets you when you get off the bus. You get that, like, when you first show up in town, beware of the person who just shows right up right away and if you don't have experience with it, you have no idea when it's happening to you. But I remember looking back 20 years ago, one of these people, and they came up, they came into my office, and they're so happy to meet me. Let me greet you, da 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 da. But now, I'm so happy you're here, but now let me tell you about all the stuff and how they're wrong and I'm right. And then you start listening to them. Oh, yeah. Oh, that is awful. You know, you, but you start pulling into it. You start getting pulled into this thing. And the next thing you know, this person is just stirring the pot. And then, and then you talk to another person. And then you're like, no. Then they give you the other side to the story. And you're like, you're the bad one. But you didn't present yourself as the bad one. You're the, and uh, so beware that person who stirs the pot to get you on their side because They want all, they say all the right things, but man, it's these people over here if we just did something about them. Whoo! And I wish it would end at one. There's always people like that. 
they come into it. And luckily, our experience over time, you start to pick it up and you start picking it out. Who is, what's happening? What's the agenda? What's going on here? So there's this people like this in life. And then you also have people in this situation, that's just a church situation, but then you have other places where it's like, blah, you know, it just gets worse and worse and worse. We have people like Jezebel and Ahab who are actually legitimately killing people. They're actually doing it. Uh, and they're able to get away with it. And so when we see this person, you got to ask the question then, is then, okay, then what do we learn um, by her inclusion in the Bible. You know, you can usually tell in the Bible, like, if, if you've got more than one chapter, you're pretty important to get in there, period. But if you get more than one chapter, you got to pay attention to those people. She's got a few chapters. Ahab's reign. Other kings get maybe a few verses, and it's just like, did evil in the sight of the Lord? Dead. Uh, evil, dead. That's all that happens. And then they got chapters on these two. So what do we learn by her conclusion? And they had a reign of 22 years. And just one thing is just simple. And the things that drive us nuts about these things, uh, what do we learn? We just learn that one, wicked people exist. They just do. Uh and it's a head scratcher because they do bad things. Think about those prophets that got killed. Naboth, who was killed. None of it's fair. You know, life is not what? Life is not fair. We want it to be, but usually we want it to be fair in my favor. That's how we usually want fair. We want fair to be in my favor. But uh, wicked things happen, people exist, and bad things, bad stuff happens. And while it's a head-scratcher to us, and it's frustrating because it's damaging, it just is. It just is. But the second thing we learn about this is not just that wicked people exist, but the second thing is that judging the wicked is not our job. Punishing the wicked is not our job. That's something that belongs to God and belongs to him alone. In verse, uh, the book of Deuteronomy in verse 32, uh, chapter 32, verse 35 says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip, their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. It is mine to avenge. God says, my job. When we're judging people, it's one sinner judging another sinner. You just can't do it. We get all worked up about it because we want to stamp out sin. We want to go against people and say, these horrible people over there, you watch this over there, and we want to fight against it, and we want to do this, and we want to do that, because we get upset about it. Something's got to happen. Anxiety pushes us to do things, that we're worried about our worldview. Is it going to be supported? And, and, and we get really upset about these things, and it's okay to get upset about things. When evil happens, we shouldn't like it. But it's not our job to go handle it. Our job is to be light. Our job is to love. Our job is to uh, be light in the world. We stand up for the truth, but God is the one who does the fighting for the truth. We stand up for it, but we don't have to go and fight people and judge people. Because, man, that comes back on you really fast. It's not our job. It is not our job to judge, to judge the wicked. You know, Paul talks about the fight for the faith. A lot of times the fight for the faith is not so much the fight for people outside, it's the fight that's within here. To be the follower that God's called me to be. Not focusing on your walk, but thinking about my walk, and how we work together and things like that, and about the people of God and about the people of God staying true to the fight. But God will take care of the other things. 
But in our anxiety, we wonder, God, when are you going to do something? When are you going to do something about this? You know, the people that lived under Jezebel, she was evil. And I'm sure there are people praying. The prophets that were hiding in the caves were certainly praying, God, when are you going to do something? When's this going to happen? Elijah's getting stressed out about it. He's like, what? She's not doing Understand this, and we learned this from the story, that wicked people will not escape judgment. It's not your job. It's not your job. It's not your job to wring your hands about it and worry about it, try to make stuff happen, try to make God's decisions for him. Understand that wicked people will not escape judgment. Because Elijah heard about it, heard what had happened to Naboth. And Elijah hears about it and comes and gives her a prophecy Gives Ahab a prophecy, yeah, um, your family's going to die on this field, in this vineyard, and you're going to die by dogs. What happened? If you know the rest of the story, his family died in the vineyard, the birds came and ate him up, and they drank, his blood was spilt in that vineyard. What happened to Jezebel? When the tide turned and another king was coming up opposing them, he looked up in the tower and she came out and she put all her makeup on and got everything to sign of power. And uh, Jehu the king looked up in the tower and said, hey, looking at the guards, whoever's loyal to her, stay there. Whoever's loyal to me, throw her down. And the guards looked at her and they 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 knew the jig was up. All right, her reign was over, so their protection was gone, and so they shoved her out the window. And she fell and tumbled down, and then uh, she fell down at the bottom of the tower, and then Jehu said, hey, uh, she's still the daughter of a king. We show her some respect, so at least go gather her so we can bury her properly. So they went down, and they found her. She had been eaten by dogs. The only thing left were her feet, her hands, and her skull. Not her face, because that was gone. Her skull. That's what was left. Let God do the job. It's his job. He predicted it to happen, and Elijah never saw it happen. That's the other thing is think about Elijah never saw it happen. All the things that we worry about, oh no, this is gonna happen. Elijah had already gone when this happened. He never saw it. You know, so much happens. We talk about time. Time. God has all of time to do his work. And we worry about it in our short little lifespans. When God has all of time. And then ultimately, God punished Jesus for all of our sins. All of it. We hadn't even existed yet. He died for all of it. But wicked people will not escape judgment. Uh, Jesus is the one he wanted to say. He said, remember, he said, when I come back, in Matthew 25, he said, when I come back, I'm going to separate the people, sheeps and goats. And then there's going to be people who love me and the people who didn't. And that's the day. It's all going to be sorted out. Again, whose job is it to sort out? Not your job. You may be there going, I can help you out. He says, I don't need your help. I got it figured out. I don't need you to tell me what to do, how to do my job. So then, what do we do then? When he encountered the wicked, what do we do? What do we do? Because, man, it's frustrating. We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. Remember in John 3, not 16, but 17, where it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I didn't come to condemn the world. That'll be sorted out in time. Jesus said, so don't condemn the world. That's not your job. There's another incident, and you may be familiar with this story, in John 8, uh, in the book of John, in chapter 8, a woman who'd been caught in adultery, been caught in sin, caught in wickedness. But other wicked people grabbed her, set her up, threw her in front of Jesus and said, the Bible says we need to stone this woman. 
wicked people judging other wicked people. And then Jesus said, famous words, let he who is without sin cast what? Cast the first stone. And he bent down, turned on the ground, and everybody there at the rock dropped it and left. The only person there who was without sin was Jesus, and he didn't throw a rock. Instead, he brought her up and he said, um, listen, there's nobody else here going to condemn you. I'm not going to do that. However, you know, your sins are forgiven, but go sin no more. Go and sin no more. So addresses it, addresses it with the truth that, yeah, what she did was wrong, but he says we're going to forgive it and now change your life and go and be free and go be free from it. Uh, so we don't have anything to worry about from God, so why do we got to push that on other people? He's forgiven me. Why do I got to push it to others? Uh, and God says it's his job to avenge and he will, uh, he'll take care of it. But how do we act? So we follow Jesus. And then there's this phrase in, I think about a Jezebel in your life. A lot of you have, probably can think of somebody right now, a Jezebel. What do you do? And Paul writes this. And Paul writes this, and he writes in the early Christian church was not in a position of political power. So evil was being done all over the place because they had, they had no rights to go take it to a boat, to a judge, to this and that, whatever it is. And Paul writes this. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, it depends on you because sometimes the person next to you, yeah, you can't deal with them because of who they are, not about you, but it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Ooh, that's such a great phrase. Leave room for God's wrath. It's like, if you're standing next to that, just take a step and just watch, see what happens, right? Uh, But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's amazing. I just let us go. Live at peace with everybody. God will take care of it. Um, I invited Jay Seelan, and one of the joys of being here for so many years, uh, Sarah, who's here, um, Sarah was in high school uh, when I first came down here, and she's one of the people that actually remembers that first sermon. She's told me that, like, out of the blue. And over the course of time, I watched her graduate college, uh, worked for me in one place, and then now she's as an admin, but I actually got to... uh, uh, I remember the day she came home from on a mission trip to India. She was not dating anybody, and she came home, and she says, I'm engaged to be married. And I'm like, what? All right. And then I'm like, so you got to tell me about this. I'm like, oh, you got to tell me. I said, all I wanted to know is, how would you tell your parents? Because uh, that's a, uh, and then that was a great story in and of itself. And it turned into be Jay, happened to be Jay, who's uh, talking about passage of time, was now a U.S. citizen. When I remember you're fighting just to get here, to get here in time for the wedding, just to get your green card, to get here for the wedding, your visa, to get for the wedding. And I was able to oversee that, and now your kids are running around, and uh, what a gift it is. But what I love about Jay is the ministry that he's been a part of since his birth in India, where... They're not in charge, where Christians are not in charge. But they have to do, and there's a lot of wickedness and evil. And so, to me, I read that passage from Romans, and I'm like, okay, Jay, you've got something for this because of what uh, the time we've po- talked to you there. So please give your attention to Jay Seelan. Thank you for this opportunity. As we, Pastor said, uh, 
you know, when the wickedness and the enemy comes around us, that we are not going to judge them. And based on this, that we have experienced so many persecutions, uh, because in India is 1.4 billion people, 88 percentage, they're all Hindus, and only two percentage are, are Christian and Catholics are come together. So when, when my dad was at Catholic um, church, he was a church secretary, and, uh, but God changed his heart, and he became a pastor. We went to the Christian church and Pentecostal church, and after eight years, my dad decided he wants to start his own church. In about, uh, so he started to build the church where we lived in, in the bottom, and then we built it, and my dad built the church above. But the, um, the problem is, where we build it in the ghetto area, we have a Hindu temple nearby, and a Muslim mosque is nearby, and a Catholic is in front of us. So it's like a triangle. And you build it right in the middle, and, and nobody liked it. And everybody's uh, persecuted. Like just, the, we, we, we were like enemies, like in front of their eyes. We walk in the street, they call us, they curse us. And um, from the society, from the family, from the neighbors, everybody, they pushed us out. Any, any privileges that we get from the government, we don't get it. For example, we got an accident, a fire accident happened. 700 houses are burned out, including our house. So the government came with all the authorities. They're making the, you know, like records and they give the money to build all their houses and whatever they last. And we were in the street. All our houses are burned out. And everybody's saying, no, 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 that's not a house. That's the church. So we did not get a penny from the government. So we ended up for three months on the street with the tarp with five kids. We lived it on, on, the, on the tarp. So we have experienced and so many times that being in a Christian, it's not easy in front of all these enemies. But you know what we will learn? Every time when they started to persecute, we started to grow. Our church started to grow, that we started to grow in our faith, that we started to come into the, get closer to God. Because so many times the people and enemies, the real enemy is not people. The real enemy is the spirit who against behind them. That's what we learn. So my dad always says, a lot of people, they come and they arrested my brother. He was on the sermon, giving the sermon. Police came. They arrested him. There is no reason. They put him in the prison for three days. And we were all like, what, what he did? No, he started the church. He's starting the gospel. And we went to all the collectors. We talked to them. None of them said, no, we're not going to release him. So my dad called all the church. Let's do fast and pray. So all the church for one Saturday from morning 8 to evening 3, just we fast and pray. And then the next day he got released and he came home. God does miracle amazingly. And the same people, they came and they shut down the church. And they said, your neighbor did not like you. You guys being more loud. And they're showing the, you know, the police paperwork. For two months, so we started to do church under undergrounds. But the reason what happened, the guy who put the case against our church, his mom got paralyzed that we did not know. She lost her arm and the legs that she couldn't walk. He took her mom to so many hospitals and so many church and temples and nothing was happening. And he got a dream, go and ask forgiveness to my dad. So the next day, we were all eating dinner in our house. This guy walked in. He was a lawyer. He was an advocate. He came in, lie down in front of my dad in touching feet and crying. Please come to my house and pray for my mom. And my dad, like, what happened? The day when I put the case against your church, the next day my mom got paralyzed. She couldn't get up and walk. And every night I couldn't fall asleep. And being, I've been getting the dream that I need to come into you and get a forgiveness. So my mom and dad, they went to their church, their house, and started to praying for her mom every day. After a fifth day, and she stood up, and she started walking on the street. And this incident happened, and all the neighbors, people, they started to see that, okay, we don't want to mess up with these people. <laughs> that's, that's a very, very powerful, and, they, and then they see, and whoever came, 
and started to opposing our churches. And one by one, one by one, over the year, over the year, they start, they start coming and their churches are transformed. And when, when I went, I started giving the tracks when I was in a teenager boys. And I did not know this guy was turning in backside and talking to them. And he was a Hindu priest. I did not know. And I tapped his shoulder. I gave him. He looked it up. And the track said, Jesus is coming soon. And, and without giving the notice, he just slapped me really hard. And I was like, I didn't expect that. <laughs> I was like, whoa. And he started to say all the other thing. And I, I don't know what to do. I just walked it back. And it was, I was crying. And it was really painful. And I told my mom, mom, this guy slapped me. He's a Hindu priest. He said, guess what? When you go to heaven, you're going to have a diamond on your ring. So don't worry about it. That's the lesson that I learned that when we're learning all of this, Bible also teach about that you love your enemies and pray for your enemies. Even in our workplace that people, they don't like us the way when we talk about God, uh, whether your school or wherever your neighbor, they don't like us. That the first thing Bible teaches that we need to love them and we need to pray for them because when we pray for them God is more powerful than any enemies and we're experiencing every single day so when I traveled I never forget this testimony when I traveled to North India there's one of the pastor that he came into the church that where we went to visit it and he was started to crying and he said we call it Naxalite Naxalite means they are like a terrorist different group they came to the church. They broke all the churches. They kidnapped two of the teenage girls. They took them into the custody. It's been three days. He has no tracks to find them. And he needs help in praying with the different churches people. And, and he was devastated because they're teenage uh, girls. And then the pastors and the church, we all come together holding their hands and praying and praying and one of the evangelist pastor, his name is G.G.S. Dinagar, and I still remember, he stood up and he said, when you go home, and God is going to bring you the girls. And he traveled from his homes to really far away to this bigger church to pray. It's eight hours travel. And when we were all here, and, and, and I saw his face, he's feared and scared, and you don't know what's going to happen. And when, and when he traveled back home, and the two of the girls are sitting in his home. So he picked up the phone, and he called it to the pastor, D.J. Sinegrin. My girls are back home. I have no idea. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. He was started crying. And, and he shared the testimony that the girls were in, the, in their territory in the, in, you know, in the mountains. They took them there. And then the girls said they want to go use the restroom. So what they did, they sent the girls with the locked you know, tie up with their rope on arm. When they went to the restroom, the army came, the Indian army came, tried to capture this, all this, the Nexalet. And then the, all the Nexalet started to run away. And then the girls used the restroom and then they came back out. Nobody was there because the army was trying to chasing them out. When they came out, they find out there is nobody else to stop them. So they helped each other untie them they walk down the mountains. Somehow they find the way. After two days, they reach their home without having any, uh, you know, like problems in their, in their body and life. And God protected them. God brought them back home. And that's how powerful the God that we serve him. We think that enemy is powerful, but our God is more powerful. When we pray for them, when we love them, and, and God will take care of the rest of them. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Jay. Uh, this, I love to so make sure it's one of the God pulls us all together uh, to encourage one another, to love one another, and to, this is about Christian community, um, is different than any others. And so, again, uh, thank you, Jay, for sharing that today. Uh, one word to remember, I'm going to think of over 20 something years patience. It's a big word. It's also a fruit of the Spirit, by the way. Love, joy, peace, patience. Let God do his thing.